welcome to both of you. Um, we've got Hayley Barker, who's the author of Showstopper here, <laughs> and Pada O'Gilly, <laughs> oh, and we've got Michelle, um, who's the author of The Call. Uh, thank you very much for coming down to um, Bournemouth to see us. Thank you. Um, okay, so our first question is, can you give us a summary of your books? Do you want to start, Hayley? Um, well, Showstopper is a YA dystopian novel. It's um, it's set in a circus, but it's not a very nice circus. In fact, it's really horrible in the circus. Um, the oppressed group in society are forced to perform. I don't know if to look at you or the camera. Look at the camera. Um, <laughs> they're forced to perform, um, and um, it's dangerous. It's deadly, and they might die. Um, it's also a love story between um, Hoshiko, who's a tightrope walker in the circus, and Ben, who um, comes to see the performance, and his mum is also one of the most important people in the country. She's not very nice, so it's, it's sort of a thrillery love story. I think uh, horrible is going to be a bit of a theme. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The call is, uh, I often describe it as uh, like a Harry Potter where everybody dies. Um, it's sort of um, the story of how the ancient she, the fairies of Ireland, finally get their revenge on the Irish. Um, they kidnap children, well teenagers, who disappear for uh, three minutes in our time, but they spend an entire day in the world of the fairies um, where they're hunted down and they have to run for their lives. And if they can get through this one terrible, terrible day, um, then they'll be fine for the rest of their lives. Um, so that's basically it. <laughs> that fine when he's fine for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So Showstopper is written from a dual point of view. So mm -hmm. you mentioned Ben and Hoshiko. Was one of them easier to write? No, not really. I um, alternated mm -hmm. um, when I was writing it. So I sort of wrote it as it is, yeah. uh, or the first draft anyway, the second yeah. draft bits and pieces came in, but um, no, not really, I think mean, maybe there's bits of me in both of them, I mean she's sort of, her sort of anger and raw um, is uh, not me at all, but <laughs> she's, I sort of liked her, that part of her, so I found that bit easy, easy to write, and he's, um, I guess he's, if either of them has a similar life to the life that I have, it's him. I mean, they're both mm -hmm. very different. But uh, yeah, I, I didn't didn't really find no, very easy no, to write. yeah, yeah. And then obviously your main point of view character, although it's not first person, is, it, is um, Nessa. So was she there from the original concept of the book? She was. Yeah, she was pretty close. I mean, the original concept. I was um, just out walking one day and I imagined a room full of crowded people and just one person disappearing. And I was kind of wondering where did they go? What happened to them? Um, that was the original bit, but then I, I had to have somebody uh, to be a character on it. And, and Nessa came along very, very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, she's from Donegal, the same way I am. Um, she went to uh, a school taking the same bus, <coughs> following the same route that I did. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, she was pretty easy in that sense. So. Um, and I think I said this to you at Yale, but it's really good to see a, a character with a disability as the, mm. as the main character in a book as well, so that's, that's excellent. So, so both books, although yours is more of a fantasy, isn't it, mm. both books have kind of these dystopian type elements. Um, it's a, a sort of it's about fighting for the land rather than sharing and working together. Um, so dystopians often sort of are about commentary on our present day, so what present day things that have inspired you in your, in your books? Um, I, um, well, I was <coughs> one of my prime motivators was the fact that I was quite concerned about the way that um, certain elements of society, certain people, um, people, um, certain media um, people as well, were suggesting that um, the faults of the country all lay at the hands of immigrants and refugees and. Um, you know, that's why the benefit system is up about, that's why the NHS is up about, it's all their fault they're coming here. Um, and I just found it really worrying, um, and it's actually got worse since, since I started, since I wrote the book, it was pre-Brexit. Um, so that was really what I was commenting on, in or wanted to sort of address the fact that we need to be tolerant, or I think we need to be tolerant, and that young adults need to... Yeah. 
I think, I think that's why the book made me so angry, actually, because it was such a commentary on what's happening now. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it, it doesn't feel that far removed, really, no, no, does it? Scary, because it, that's why I don't, know, I don't know if I would describe it at all as fantasy, because it's almost... Yeah. Well, yeah. You're, you're making it happen by writing that book. You're, you're, you're made it happen. Oh, no. <laughs> you did. You, 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 you caused, you caused <laughs> it. <laughs> I'm sorry to be the one who said it. I'm going to disappear in a minute. <laughs> I'm going to get the call. Yes. I'll hunt you for an entire day. Yeah. And what about you into the modern fantasy? Well, um, I mean, the basic idea is, is an old Irish legend where the Irish took the land of a people called the people of the goddess Danu, the mm -hmm. Tilde Danu, um, and they were sent away. And the last line of the Book of Invasions, an old Irish text, is the king of the people of the goddess Danu led his people under the mounds. And <laughs> but that, that's it. And we, we don't know where they went. Yeah. And there are lots of legends saying where they might have gone, and there are all these nice places. Mm -hmm. But actually, we know um, from, you know, from what happened in the United States, um, to the Native Americans, we know from Ireland when Cromwell said to hell or to Connacht, we know um, from large parts of the world going on right this minute, that when someone comes in and takes land from someone less militarily powerful, they don't give them somewhere nice, they don't send them to the Blessed Isles, as, as some people think, they send them to some horrible mud-sucking hole, and if you don't go to the mud-sucking hole, they kill you. And that is happening right now in loads of places all around the world. Um, it's, it's a real thing. So um, a friend of mine was, was recently reading the call and hadn't read it before. And she was saying, is it wrong that I feel sorry for the, for the she in this? who are kind of the monsters, but is it wrong that I feel sorry for them? Mm -hmm. And not really. Um, I, I deliberately have things in this, and it, certainly in the sequel, mm -hmm. make it very obvious that it's fair enough to feel sorry for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, They're you displaced people, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, of course you still have to save yourself from them, mm -hmm. but, you know. But you can kind of understand yeah. some of their, yeah. their motivations in doing it. Yeah. yeah. So again, both of them are about sort of children rich from their everyday lives to a, a place where they're battle to survive. How much of a metaphor do you think that is for growing up in, in your books? <laughs> well, I guess the teenage years when everybody faces their own different battles, aren't they, and, and changes, and, and certainly, you know, we might not, well, we're not in these awful situations, but we, we have to battle our parents and you know we, we change and we we, you sh we learn to challenge things hopefully as we grow up and, and learn to sort of look at what's around us and question it. Yeah. Um, so I hopefully that's something that young adults can relate to yeah. even if they're not sort of going through. I think they might relate to it um, but I do think in the third world people actually go through things that are that bad. Yeah. Um, I, I saw a documentary on Netflix there a few months ago about the White Helmets, that these people who, in, in um, I can't remember which city it was now, but one of the cities in Syria that, that basically just every day, every single day, risked their lives pulling people from rubble, mm -hmm. and children, and families, and absolutely horrific stuff that these kids go through. And I can't imagine that most of them will ever be the same again after it. And, and that's kind of what, what I was trying to get at there, that yes, if they survive, I said they'll be fine, but yeah. actually none of them are. And you, can, yeah. you can see it that none of them are ever completely fine again. Um, but that really does happen to people, that, that sort of thing. Um, and it is, it is terrible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so obviously you, you had the myth to kind of draw you, but what was uh, both your sort of process of research and world building? Because obviously you've got the fairy lands, which is um, not real. <laughs> and, you've got the, <laughs> and you've got the circus, which is not real. Um, so how did you go about sort of creating those worlds? I wanted to write that circus for ages. Um, not, not book like one I end up writing, but I just... I loved reading about circuses when I was growing up, and I don't not particularly fond of real circuses, but there's something about fictional circuses that's sort of magical. Mm. Mm. This, they're, they're this kind of alternative place. This, yeah. this, um, they kind of exist alongside the real world, but in in fiction anyway, they're, they're 
the possibilities are different. And, and so I wanted to do that. So I, I did read a lot of books about historical circuses and modern circuses, and I was looking at all, you know, um, the way that the circus changed. But I didn't really know what I was going to do. And, and originally it was because I wanted to, to address animals in circuses as well. Yeah. Which, because... I just can't believe it's still not yeah. illegal to have animals in circuses. Um, but then, because of the idea, because of what I was thinking about society and what I wanted to sort of think about there, the, the two ideas kind of came together. So my research was reading about the circuses and looking at. There's a, a bit in the book where Hoshiko she balances on a stool, um, and I remember my editor. She said this. This seems a bit far fetched, and I said, "But no, it's not, because I watched it on yeah, Ukraine's yeah. Got Talent yeah, on yeah, um, yeah. YouTube. But um, yeah. somebody does it, and there's things. So little, just little bits as I went along, really. I sort of look up. There, so lots of YouTube videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I basically more or less invented the the Greyland um, where the where the she were living, and the, the idea behind it was, as I said, you don't get to go to paradise, you don't get the good land. So I wanted to make it as horrific as possible. Um, mainly so that the she would hate us as much as possible, you know, to give them a really, really good reason um, to hate us. Yeah. So I, I built it up um, from previous things I'd written. I added in small little details to make their lives worse. Um, there's a thing I have in it called a window. Yeah. So they live in this horrible, horrible place, but now and again they get glimpses into our world, which is in comparison, absolute paradise, and they get to see that, and that, that was partly to torture them, but also a, as a reminder that people in the third world have television, and they see, they get a glimpse into our world, which is paradise in comparison, you know what I mean, and I, and I just wonder how much they must resent us, you know, considering a, a lot of their problems are because of us and because of the way we live, you know, um, especially now, kind of, uh, you know, uh, climate change and so on. A lot of that is because we've burnt up so much coal, and now they're not allowed to. Yeah. Oh no, no, you make global warming worse. Yeah. But we got all this because we did it. <laughs> you know. So yeah, it, it was it was that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, and there's echoes of that. I think with the dregs, isn't it? And how they do. Because, yeah. So it's, mm -hmm. I don't know, it was a horrible to the dregs, but actually, there's that atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so both of your books did make me quite cheesy in places. How do you come up with the more gruesome aspects? Um, and do you ever give yourself the heebie jeebies when you're writing? Actually, my. Um, I, it wasn't showstopper wasn't originally as gory as it is now and the, the ed, my, my editor said can you make, can you make it dark can you make it more gory and, and, and I did and then she said oh we've gone a bit too far we've got to take some of it out so, um, so um, yeah it's just um, but you I seem think so you light just... and jolly so how do you go <laughs> to that place I'm always thinking about <laughs> um, I think I, I just um, would take something and then think oh how can I make it a little bit worse how can I make it a little and, just, um, and actually, the second book, I, which I'm writing at the moment, I did. Um, I was trying to think how I could write certain scenes, and I did ask for some ideas on Facebook, and, and lots of my friends came up with really <laughs> low tweets. So it's not just me. <laughs> so I'll have to credit them. So, yeah. What about you and Gore? I had to. I had to dial myself back quite a lot. Um, my my first novel um, was The Inferior, which was written from the point of view of cannabis mm -hmm. and a cannabis society. And the idea was that you would read this and sympathise with them because although what they're doing is horrible by our standards, they had no choice. That's just the situation they found themselves in. They could not have survived if they hadn't lived that way. Um, and a lot of people considered it you know, too horrible, too gory. Um, and so I said, right, this time, Padre, no, this time you can't, you can't do that. <laughs> this time you got to, you know, dial right back, right back. And I thought, and I thought when I handed it in, I said, well, no one's going to complain about that. No one's going to find that too, too disgusting and horrible. I was, I was very wrong. <laughs> uh, a lot of people were worse. I had uh, some, I have some delightful one-star reviews. I don't want my grandchildren reading this. Oh. You know, this, this, this kind of stuff. Um, exactly what the grandchildren love. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's, it's usually parents who worry. Yeah. It's kids are fearless and yeah. don't really think they're ever going to die, yeah. and so they will really enjoy this kind of thing. And, and, and the more, the merrier. Yeah. Okay. So now we've got a, a couple of fun questions. 
So, if you were to perform in a circus, what would your circus <laughs> be? <laughs> and that's both of you. <laughs> I'd be awful the tightrope. I'd be awful doing any of it, actually. I can't really, um, what would I be? I don't really like fire. I don't really like um, But I would be... That's a good one, yeah. Popcorn seller. <laughs> I'd like to say I'd be a beautiful, elegant tightrope walker, but I just really, really like it. But you got any secret circus skills? Um, I like climbing things. Yeah. Yes, I will climb something. Okay. I don't know what yet, but I, <laughs> I'll figure it out and I will climb it. You'll climb uh, it. I'm also pretty good at standing there while people throw things, and, and I, a bit like the the young people we were talking about earlier. I don't really think I'm going to die. So yeah. It's uh, oh yeah. So you the knife assistant. Yeah, the knife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll do. I'll stand. Nothing can go wrong. <laughs> you can throw the knives. <laughs> yeah. you can be the knife well, maybe assistant. maybe not Haley. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not Haley. And then, if you were to end up in the Greylands, what would you be your strategy for survival? Oh, I think I would, it, I'd just have to hide. What else could I do? I'd just have to hide. Yeah. I'd behind a little rock and stay there. Hiding is good. <laughs> hiding, hiding is a good one. Um, the one thing I, the one thing I advise everybody who's who's afraid of getting called mm -hmm. is don't give up because luck plays a huge part. Yeah. I mean, when I was writing those scenes, I didn't actually know at the start when I was writing if that person was going to live or die it just I'd be writing away and go oh this would be a really good way to kill somebody oh yeah too bad you're, got, you're done for now sorry Kyle you're dying you know um, you know so it was, it was quite random like a lot of the time I mean there were a few I knew what had to happen with them but, but with a lot of them it was just ooh this, this is what's going to happen luck definitely plays a part yes always keep going yes Okay, and then what's coming next in your So obviously you've got a uh, title for your next book, which is The Invasion. Yeah. So what's, what's, what will we find out next without too many stories? <laughs> well, I think it's in the title, really. You the know, I, I think it's in the title. <laughs> I mean, if you, if, you got, if you made it to the end of the call, mm -hmm. you, you'll see what, what almost happened, and uh, that's going to happen. So... It's, it's, um, I didn't dial myself back at a certain point, <laughs> I probably should have. Um, so, yeah, no, no, I, yeah. that's exactly Is it a trilogy or a trilogy? No, that's it, no, two books. That's it, yeah. two books. Two books, so yeah. we, get, we get the ending, okay. You get an ending. An ending. <laughs> when, is it, when is it out? March. Oh, it, it's, it's done ages ago, it's done ages ago. It's just that the, the publishing schedules of the, the Americans and the British, they wanted to have them out the same day or the same week at least, so it had to work out. To work out. Yeah. 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 Um, we don't have a title for yours do we? No, I do know the title, but I don't know if I'm allowed to say it Exactly, that's what um, I thought. Showstarters. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Yeah. I was going to say, my friends and I suggested something, yeah, but I can't remember what it was now. Somebody suggested something, yeah, but I was using it and I couldn't remember what it was. Who did you And I said to my editor, what time did that be? Could it be now? Yeah. Oh, we just got something off camera. Off camera, we'll have a look. So what's, um, so you're in second draft of the process at the moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how's that going? Yeah, it's going all right. Yeah, I did about 60,000 in the first draft and then I wanted to give it to them because I had to write a synopsis mm -hmm. and then when I wrote the book it's completely different to it um, mm -hmm. so I wanted to check that they were sort of happy with it mm -hmm. Scholastic I mean, just the cheek my, my lovely editor is so, um, so I'm just kind of developing it a bit more and adding to it a bit more yeah. and, um, and presumably this is more sort of outside of the circus now yeah Ooh. Ooh. Okay, really, the circus is back the circus is that back was the one thing that, 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 that Scholastic asked Actually, yeah. can you somehow bring it back mm. to the circus? I think yeah. that was the, the setting was yeah. one thing. Like, the circus is back, but it's bigger and better and darker mm. and horrible. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.